This is 49ers Talk brought to you by Big O Tires. And Laura, I knew something would be out of the ordinary on Sunday, even before this game started. Oh, did you? I did because I left my hotel to make the walk that I really like, uh, downtown Seattle, going to the game. And I get about a couple blocks away and I realize I forgot my podcast equipment. And so I had to walk back to the hotel and then I caught a ride back to the stadium. And then once I arrive at the stadium, I get a text from you saying what? That I forgot my podcast equipment. I had no idea. You withheld this information from me all day until this moment. That is, that is correct. Wow, that's talent. So I knew this was going to be an out of the ordinary day. And the 49ers loss on Sunday to the Seattle Seahawks, 30 to 23, was a wild, wild game. And yeah, it, the from first beginning quarter, to end. Yeah. For, uh, the first quarter took about an hour. Um, I remember at one point I was just, I felt like I was just exhausted watching this thing. I wonder how the players felt. And it started on such a bad note with Trenton Cannon uh, getting injured on the opening kickoff. The ambulance comes out for him. We have good news to report. He was scheduled to spend the night in Seattle at a hospital. He was diagnosed with a concussion. And obviously that's, that's very serious. Anytime anyone sustains a concussion, but that was the extent of his injury. As far as the 49ers uh, revealed to us, Kyle Shanahan said there wasn't anything else, uh, just a concussion. I don't want to say just a concussion because I don't want to minimize that. But, but ruling out all other uh, major complications, which yeah, is so, a, a positive. So that's, that was great news. I just wanted to get that out of the way. And so it started, this game started on just a, a weird note and just kind of made you not feel right about, you know, the, the way things were going from the get-go. And then uh, the, the teams managed to keep that you know, on the back of their minds and they played a crazy football game far from perfect for both teams um 49ers did not have to play perfectly to win this game against seattle they did not play perfectly they played far from perfect they played so imperfect that they lost this game and as nick bosa so succinctly summed it up after the game yeah we kind of blew it yeah, I mean, they did. There's no way around it. They blew it. I think that's the good and the bad in this. It wasn't that they got out or this was all the 49ers' fault. This was a game that they could have easily won, and that's what makes it so frustrating is that it was self-inflicted wounds. Kyle Shanahan talked about that in the post-game presser. But it's also what makes it good in that a 3-8, and eight, as they were coming into this game, Seattle Seahawks team is not – necessarily better than you you just if you're the 49ers you just didn't put your best foot forward the, I will say there was something with the Trenton Cannon injury it was a DJ Jones talked about it after the game how hard it is to come back from that that that's not easy to see your teammate go down in that way and then you don't know what's going on for the rest of the game that's not an excuse he was not making an excuse um he was asked about that and how difficult it was it to come back and and he was honest in his answer and said that but this was totally a game that reminded me of the 49ers four game losing streak and was a complete 180 of everything that they did right on their three game winning streak they didn't control time of possession they didn't run the ball effectively they had turnovers and the Seahawks did too the 49ers defense did a good job of creating some some turnovers too, but the, the Niners didn't take care of the football. It, it just wasn't a, a smooth game. Yeah. And I know last week when we were talking before 49ers talk live on Thursday, we looked at like third down conversions and when the 49ers were, well, were they three and five on the season? They converted 33% of their third downs. And when they were on that three game winning streak, they converted 50% of their third downs and in this game against the Seattle Seahawks week 13, they completed 30% or converted 30% of their third down. So in a lot of ways, that is what enables you to run the ball. You know, when you're picking up those five yard uh, plays, pass plays on third and four, keeps the chains moving, allows you more opportunities to run the ball. And, the, you know, the 49ers had a very difficult time running against Seattle's eight man box and, you know, Seattle 
the stats kind of lie with Seattle because you know they give up so many rushing attempts per game, but the yards aren't bad at all. And they're actually the third best team in the league as far as yards allowed per carry for the defense. And that's what they did on Sunday against the 49ers and against Elijah Mitchell. I mean, they really shut him down and weren't able, you know, the 49ers weren't able to sustain those long drives. And, and they just, um, you know, they fell short. They had that one opportunity at the end where the defense came up with another stand, another big sequence of huge defense. moment for the defense. Yeah. And when you think about it, the defense again, held up its end of the bargain. You know, just yeah. like week four against Seattle, the defense played well enough to win that game, but it was the offense. It was special teams week four. This game against Seattle, the defense played well enough. The offense and special teams really let the team down, especially special teams. I mean, I was so I was so amazed coming out of that injury to Cannon, how the 49ers defense was flying to the ball. They forced a three and out immediately. The only problem was it wasn't a three and out because the Seahawks ran a play on fourth down out of fake punt position. Uh, the up back, Travis Homer, takes it 73 yards. The 49ers looked like they had no clue that that was even a possibility they could do something like that. Seattle obviously had scouted the 49ers a punt return unit and figured that they could make a big play going through the left side there. And that's exactly what they did. And that didn't necessarily you know, that didn't win the game for Seattle, but I tell you what, that momentum, um, and you know, the Fourniers came back and took the lead, but man, that, that play right there got the, got Seattle rolling a little bit, or at least just kind of gave them some life early on. And then, uh, you know, more, more turnovers, uh, more bad special teams play a missed extra point, a fumble by Travis Benjamin on the opening kickoff of the second half. The offense opened the door, a couple Jimmy Garoppolo interceptions. Um, and so that's where we are, 49ers, 6-6. Six and six. And Seattle, you know, we had pretty much ridden them off for dead. And, and let's face it, Seattle's not going to the playoffs. They will have their first losing season in the Russell Wilson, Pete Carroll era. But uh, things got a whole lot more difficult for the 49ers. We'll talk more about that later. But this, this game, so many layers so many things to discuss and i'm going to ask you laura i wasn't able to watch the post game show what were dante and takio and joe staley what were they talking about after this one it was surprisingly positive i think the big negatives were the fact that the 49ers did this to themselves and that's what i was discussing just a few moments ago was the fact that it's it's not as bad because it's not that they couldn't have won this game or weren't capable of it, but they did all of the things that they know not to do. And I, I got to tell you on the watching Kyle Shanahan's post game presser after the loss on Sunday there, I don't know. There are very few moments. This was probably top five moment over the past four years that I've seen him that frustrated. He was really really frustrating you could tell it was an emotional game i think just from start to finish he was he was frustrated and really just disappointed is kind of the yeah. overwhelming sense that i got from him was exhaustion and disappointment and frustration you know why i think i think they were really prepared for this game i, I, do I, too. I, I don't I think, think there was were. anything about the 49ers that weren't prepared i don't think they were taking the seahawks lightly either. no not at all and i think I think they were ultra prepared. I think they knew exactly on defense. I think D'Amico Ryan's had his guys coached up to know exactly what Seattle wanted to do with the football. And you could tell that from the beginning. I mean, they had stuff sniffed out. You know, they, they, it's almost like they were in the huddle and, and knew what the play calls were. I thought offensively, Kyle Shanahan knew what kind of game it was going to be. And, you know, they did have success through the air. I mean, they averaged 9.5 yards per pass attempt. That should win you a game. And defensively, the Seahawks only averaged 4.4 yards per pass attempt. It's, I don't know how you win a game like that if you're Seattle, and I don't know how you lose, lose a game like that if you're the 49ers with that kind of disparity. So I think the coaching staffs on the offensive and defensive sides of the ball knew exactly what it was going to take to win this game. But then you have those mistakes. You have the penalties, and you know whether they were good calls or not, 
uh, you had the, the mistakes on, on special teams, you had the failed third down conversions, and then all of that boils down to the end of the game. And the 49ers just couldn't push it over the goal line. And so that's why I think Kyle Shanahan was so frustrated was that he felt like the guys were prepared and they acted, they looked prepared. They looked like they weren't taking Seattle lightly. We knew they won it, but for them to do all the right things on one level, but not do all the right things on the level, I guess that matters most. That's probably where the frustration, not just for Kyle Shanahan, every player that we talked to that I asked questions to on Sunday after the game, they were to a man. You could feel it. You could sense it in their voices. You could read it with their body language. That was a very frustrated 49ers locker room after this loss. One thing it wasn't, though, was it wasn't hopeless. They didn't have hopelessness where from weeks three to week seven, it really kind of felt like the 49ers had lost a lot of hope. And then, as Fred Warner said on 49ers talk, that defense got together, had a players only meeting, and um, things really started to shift after that for them when they went to Chicago and, and beat the Bears. But it, it, it's not a hopeless team, but it was a frustrating team frustrated team that you could tell on Sunday after they fall to the Seahawks. And you were asking what all the guys were saying on the post game show after the game on Sunday. And I got to tell you about Joe because Dante and Takio have had some space in between their playing time, but Joe, this is still very fresh. He was under Kyle Shanahan. He played with these guys. He's still very invested in this team. And he, that the hatred he has for Seattle hatred. <laughs> Oh, hatred he has really? for Seattle. Absolutely. Yes. This is not like some small thing. He really still feels this rivalry to his core. And you could tell, and he was so disappointed because he felt like, and I agree with him on this going into this game. It wasn't something that I was overlooking as the 49ers are, you know, just going to breeze right past the Seahawks. This, the 49ers cannot play in Seattle. They cannot play in Seattle. The numbers are there and this is not some small sample size this is 10 years i mean really since pete carroll and russell wilson have been together it's the, the 49ers just struggle in seattle and so joe was just so hopeful he, he went back to the beginning of the day you know we come in sunday morning talking about just how this is going to be the day that the 49ers kind of put the nail in the coffin for pete carroll and russell wilson that era and say so long no more of that and so it was really tough for him in the post game show. Just he wanted that so badly for this team. And you know, these guys did, you know, these and, and Kyle Shanahan, they want to get past that. And it seems that they just really struggle getting past it. Didn't you get the sense from the early on that Seattle felt like they were overmatched and that they had to do something. They had to do something out of the ordinary. They had to steal some possessions. They had to do a fake punt. They had to try some trickery. It seemed to me like Pete Carroll's plan was if we just play him toe to toe, it's not going to go well. But if we do some stuff, if we kind of mess with them a little bit, if we get some, some yardage that isn't there or trick them in a certain way, maybe we can kind of gain some momentum. That's the way I felt that that's the way Seattle started this game. Well, I think it gave them belief. This yeah. was a really struggling Seahawks team. Three game losing streak heading into the week week 13 matchup against. I like how you <laughs> said week, my week 13. 13 matchup against the 49ers. These weeks, these weeks always get me. They do. They get me too. But they they needed something. And I know that the 49ers came back and took the lead after that. But that gave the Seahawks a belief a belief like, Hey, we jumped out to an early lead. We can take on the 49ers. I do. I agree. I think it took that moment and you could see Pete Carroll on the sideline so fired up and the team got this lift that they desperately needed. Was he chomping the gum? Could you tell? Was he chewing that gum like nobody's business? I, if I had to take a guess, yes. I wasn't paying attention to Pete Carroll's gum chewing, but um, that's, that's one thing that Joe has talked about in the past too. I just don't want to see Pete Carroll over there chewing, chomping on his gum. Yeah. I, I think to me that the main part of this game where, yeah, the, the fake punt was, was big, but as you mentioned, the 49ers did take the lead after that, but they got the ball with, uh, I think it's about six minutes left, a little, maybe a little less than six minutes right before the end of the half. And their thing has been, and they've been so good at this 
drain the clock and especially you win the, the opening coin toss, you elect to defer. So you, you know you're getting the ball to start the second half. So the 49ers have been so good at this. They do these long methodical drives. They drain the clock. And then on the final play or inside 30 seconds, they either kick a field goal and get their three points. They score a touchdown, get their seven. They don't leave the other team enough time to, to regroup and come back down the field. And then the 49ers get the ball back at the end of the of halftime to start the third quarter. Well, it worked out great for the 49ers, except for one thing, that darn George Kittle, he's just too darn good because he scored on a 48-yard touchdown with 148 left in the first half, which gave Seattle enough time to kind of have a back at you drive. And that's exactly what they did. Pretty long kickoff return two very costly roughing the passer penalties, one on Arden Key, one on Charles Amenahu. And the next thing you know, Russell Wilson's thrown to D. Eskridge against the, the defense of Diamador Lenore. They score a touchdown. And now all of a sudden, it turns into the Seahawks having that end of second quarter, beginning of third quarter, because then Travis Benjamin fumbles. And I think the 49ers offense went so long without touching the ball. They had a difficult time getting in rhythm. George Kittle, who lit it up in the first half, didn't see the ball thrown his way in the third quarter. And he heated up again, you know, late in the game on that final drive. But that was a very key sequence. And, you know, perhaps Seattle kind of misplayed it at the end uh, to give the 49ers a chance to go down there and, and get the tying points and potentially – send this game into overtime, but that is, that has been the key for the 49ers, that sequence, second quarter to third quarter, where they usually kind of put the game out of reach or grab a lot of momentum, but this time it was Seattle who did it, and Seattle didn't even get the opening kickoff at the start of the third quarter. Yeah, well, and it was Seattle that ends up the first points on the, well, the 49ers didn't score in the second half of this game at all. All 23 of their points came in the first half of the game, the the Seahawks end up scoring nine in the third quarter. Nobody scores in the fourth, but in the third, the Seahawks come out and sack Jimmy Garoppolo in the end zone for a safety. And that ties up the game. And from, it was after you go through something like that, it just felt like this game was going all Seattle's way. And how loud was it there? Cause I was wondering about that. I mean, we can hear on TV, but it, it's different when you're there. One thing I was curious about is you always hear about how loud it is, the 12th man, all that. But with the Seahawks struggling as they have been as of late, I was wondering if the fan base was going to be as invested. Um, I don't think they are because uh, if you're watching this um, behind me is where the 49 ers sideline is and all those blue seats you see back there, they were red. There were a lot of 49er fans. And when the 49ers would get a, there was a play fourth down uh, quarterback sneak where Jimmy Garoppolo got the yardage, but they bring, brought the chains out and both teams didn't know, you know, it was going to be a first down for the 49ers or it was going to be Seahawks ball. And when the chains showed that Jimmy Garoppolo picked up the first down crowd, crowd went crazy. So there are a lot of 49er fans here. Um, in fact, one of the 49er fans at the hotel, I was, well, I saw him in the lobby. We talked, took some pictures and I, I was walking to the stadium and then I turned around and go, went back to the hotel because I forgot my podcast equipment. And I because said, hey, you go get your podcast yeah. equipment. I when said, you I said it. to him, I said, do you, uh, do you listen to the podcast? And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, because of you, I'm walking back to get my podcast equipment. So anyway, wow. Uh, you're blaming our listeners. No, now. I didn't blame him. I just, wow. Said, doing this New for lows for you, Matt. Little, I, know. I, I mean, Hey, there are a lot of lows on Sunday for everyone. Uh, from the Bay Area, but man, what what an, it, it was! This probably isn't a real popular opinion, but it was an entertaining game. I mean, it was it had me on the edge of my seat. It had me exhausted by the second quarter, and it's going to give us a lot more to talk about. And we'll continue this discussion after this word from Big O Tires. 
At Big O Tires, you can trust that you're getting a good deal. Hurry into your local Big O for tires, services, and great deals you can trust. Plus, pay nothing today with easy and affordable financing options for nearly any budget. Big O Tires, the team you trust. We are back on 49ers Talk. And Laura, as I do every game after the game, it's kind of a knee-jerk reaction, but I come up with my grades uh, for the for the 49ers and, and how they fared. And uh, I'm just going to kind of breeze through them. The rushing offense, I give the 49ers a C minus. Uh, you know, no turnovers with the rushing offense, but certainly couldn't get a whole lot of yardage against the, the Seahawks uh, stacked box. Uh, passing offense, I gave them a D, D plus. Uh, that Yes, they passed for a lot of yards, almost 300 yards, but the turnovers, the, the two interceptions for Garoppolo, uh, the, sa- the safety, the sack in the end zone. So, you know, 49ers being not good on third downs, D plus. I, I thought the rushing defense was really good. You know, it, the stats sheet shows that the Seahawks rushed for 146 yards, but remember 73 of those were on that play uh, on special teams, the fake punt. So I gave them an A. Passing defense I thought was pretty good. You know, it, as easy it is to criticize the 49ers defensive backfield and things – could have gone really wrong after Emmanuel Mosley went out and we'll see where that injury is. And Diamandor Lenore certainly was picked on. And then Dante Johnson came in. I thought he played well, but just think of all the turnovers, the 49ers forced with their passing game, uh, their passing defense. Uh, they had uh, three takeaways Aziz Alshire and DJ Jones forced fumbles. Uh, boy, I tell you what, Gerald Everett, the, uh, the Seattle tight end. Oof. What a bad day he had. He had three turnovers in that game. In fact, there was a joke, like, who are they, who's the 49ers PR department going to come in and talk to us? Uh, and someone joked, I wonder if they're going to bring in Gerald Everett because he did all he could to win a game for the 49ers. He was trying, trying oh, very God. hard, but the 49ers were like, nah, yeah. they won't take the hell. Right, and K1, uh, K1 Williams had the interception that was also on a play that Everett should have caught the ball. So I thought the 49ers passed defense was was pretty good, especially when you consider, as I mentioned, that 4.4 yards uh, per attempt. And Russell Wilson, you know, he he threw the ball 37 times, only had 231 yards passing, and the 49ers sacked him four times for 50 yards. Nick Bosa with his 12th sack in 12 games. Um, so A minus I gave for the pass defense. Uh, special teams not good. That's an F. Yeah. Coaching coaching I thought was. I, I gave them a C plus uh, could have been a better grade. I don't know. Maybe, maybe our listeners don't agree with that. And then overall a D, you know, when you, you factor in the penalties, everything else uh, that has to do with this. One of the more interesting things though, was a topic of conversation. And I think it's something that everybody would be wondering at home. George Kittle had the great first half. He had the great final drive. And then they get down to the three yard line and they don't throw him the ball. So I asked Kyle Shanahan about that, and he said he was the number one in the progression. But the way the Seattle Seahawks played that led Garoppolo to go elsewhere, and they felt like Trent Sherfield was held or interfered with on the third down play. And then they felt, well, they felt that Trent Sherfield would have had the touchdown had Carlos Dunlop, all six foot six of him, and as Trent Williams said, power forward arms, if he hadn't gotten up there and batted that, that ball down. So you go watch of, the video. I don't, I, I agree with him. Yeah. yeah. And, and so um, the one thing I asked Kyle was like, Hey, you know, from a layman standpoint, I, I just wonder, is it okay? Or is, should Garoppolo have forced the ball in, you know, even if he's double covered, do you force the ball into to George Kittle and just allow him to, to make a play and see what happens. And Kyle kind of repeated my question, like throw it to him when he's double covered. And I was like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm asking. And he goes, no, <laughs> no we don't do that. <laughs> and, and that is basically Garoppolo, you know, said the same thing and Kittle said the same thing. Garoppolo made the reads and they felt like they had two legitimate scoring opportunities going to Trent Shurfield, but it didn't work out. And that's all that matters. Yeah, and I want to stick with some positives from this game. George Kittle was a huge positive. And to everyone (laughs) over this, really this season, that's like, where's George Kittle? Where's George Kittle? George Kittle 
has had his presence felt out on the field. I assure you of that. Debo Samuel would not be having the season that he is, and Elijah Mitchell would not be having the season that he is without a lot of help and great blocking from George Kittle. So just because he's on your fantasy team and he hasn't been lighting up the stat sheet like you want, I just get so frustrated with that because he's such a big part of the team, even when he's not putting up numbers like he did on Sunday against Seattle, which was nine receptions for 181 yards and two touchdowns. Can I ask, can I just uh, interject here before the game? There's a Seattle fan who's like the most obnoxious guy on the Oh, planet. I've heard about him from Joe. Yeah, he, he's, I mean, he's not the kind of guy you'd want over for Thanksgiving dinner. You know? Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, um, but he had this sign, big sign, and it's right by, his, his seats are right by where the 49ers tunnel is. And so his sign was, Kittle wishes he was Gronkowski. And so Kittle's over there. Kittle's always pretty good with the fans. He sees someone with a Kittle jersey. He signs it. Uh, he, he's always pretty good about, nah, what is it? about an hour 15 before kickoff and he saw that obnoxious guy with the sign he went right over there and signed it i and saw that went, picture and i yeah. was like is he signing that he yeah. signs off he's like yep i agree yeah no it was kind of like yeah that's yeah i, I wish <laughs> i'll sign off on this yeah so george kittle to, 12 targets he had nine catches 181 two touchdowns huge game for george kittle and also you you just mentioned in your grades aziz alshire what big shoes to fill stepping in for Fred Warner. So uh, of course, no Debo Samuel on Sunday in the loss to the Seahawks and no uh, Fred Warner, no Dre Greenlaw either, but this was the first game Fred Warner's missed and Kyle Shanahan and, and the defensive staff felt good about Aziz Alshire wearing the green dot on his helmet and directing the defense. And I thought he did a really admirable job. He, he definitely did. And it was funny about, you know, I didn't expect, I did not expect Fred Warner to play in this game, but inactives come out 90 minutes before kickoff and about, I don't know, 110 minutes before kickoff. Here comes Fred Warner out of the 49ers locker room. He's not in uniform, but at that time, nobody is like, they're just in shorts or, you know, they're in their cleats, but they're just going through kind of pre pre pre-game warmups, like before pre-game warmups. The pre-pre-game warmups. Exactly. And so I saw Fred Warner doing, you know, is it karaoke? Not karaoke where he's singing. Oh, yeah, yeah, and the like, knee thing. Yeah, yeah. Or just kind of the, the scissors, you know, running, kind of crossover steps. And I'm looking at him going, is he going to play in this game? He has the hamstring. Um, and it's not a super serious hamstring injury. But I'm thinking – is he going to play? They listened to him as doubtful. And the reason they didn't list him as out was because he's Fred Warner and he's never missed a game. So they wanted to kind of give him that opportunity. And so I'm thinking, is he going to play? I, but he didn't. But I think just watching him run made me think that, okay, he's definitely going to play against the, the Bengals next week. And so Aziz Alshire, as you mentioned, the green dot, he had 16 tackles, 11 solo, five assisted. He had half a sack. He had a tackle for loss. He had a forced fumble. He That was as good of a Fred Warner impression as I've ever seen. Aziz Alshire, that man is a keeper. He is, and I've really enjoyed just watching him take off this season. And when you hear about coaches talking about players, you got to seize the moment. you got to seize the opportunity when you get it in the NFL. He's the epitome of that. He has done that, and I've I've mentioned on one of our previous podcasts just about we've had him on the post game show a few times, and I've I've so enjoyed those discussions and those conversations. He's I get the sense that he's really just himself, and he's you know long winded in his answers, which is not something typically after a game that you know these players have all this stuff going on in their head. You call him long winded? No, well, I I mean it, I mean that in the best possible okay. way. That's usually, a good thing <laughs> on a post game show. Usually you get a lot of short answers from players. And I totally understand that. Cause you've just come, you know, off this emotional high and um, he's just, yeah, been... and he was good today too. You know, I asked him, I asked him about uh, maybe the mixed emotions of having such a great game, but losing. And what he said was, Hey, when, when your team wins, then the, the individual stuff follows. Like mm -hmm. if your team wins, that means you've done enough to help the team win. So that's a good day. Yeah. And, and I, I'm assuming that he's 
saying that when they lose, you know, you're not fo- focused on individual accolades. He just seems to have it together up here, you know, and, and he just, I, I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed yeah. seeing him succeed. I enjoyed on Sunday watching him have a great game against the Seahawks. Um, but it, it is, it, it's just, it's a shame that the 49ers couldn't continue that momentum because this would have been an, an easier game to have been able to continue that momentum against the Seahawks. And then, you know, to Joe's point, you can kind of start to move on from this, not that they'll move on from the rivalry, but that they can kind of reclaim themselves in this rivalry, the 49ers. And it's not it. 2021, what in the year for them to reclaim themselves against the Seattle Seahawks? 49ers Talk is brought to you by FitAid. FitAid fuels your body with complete sports recovery using the power of targeted supplements and vitamins. Train hard, recover fast. So we mentioned Emmanuel Mosley going down with that injury. We don't know the extent of it, but it's an ankle and he didn't return to the game. So it kind of makes you wonder, you know, what his availability will be going, uh, will be like going forward. Emmanuel was having a really good season. And he's a pretty good player, and he's definitely a long-term starter for the 49ers. But what that injury did was it basically made Josh Norman their number one cornerback. And if you watch the second half, which I'm sure you all did, you may have noticed that everywhere DK Metcalf went, Josh Norman went. And I thought Josh Norman had a a pretty good game. You know, none of these defensive backs are ever going to have a perfect game. Uh, at least you wouldn't think, especially when you go up against a guy like Russell Wilson and wide receivers like Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. But uh, all in all, you know, when, when Diamador Lenore went in, you had to kind of question the 49ers depth. And I think that's totally legitimate. Uh, you know, they, they began the season hoping that it's going to be Jason Verrett and Emmanuel Mosley the entire season. And then they pick up Josh Norman right before the start of the regular season. And now he's, you know, he's a starter. He's entrenched. Um, but Diamondor Lenore struggled and, and Russell Wilson being the veteran he is, they, they went after him. I, I think the long pass play to Metcalf was a play where the safety could have come over. And that was probably more on the safety than on Lenore, but then the second half starts and the 49ers put Dante Johnson out there. And I, I, I just, I appreciate Dante Johnson. You know, I'm, I'm part of the Dante Johnson Appreciation Club because I know how difficult this game is. And when there are guys who are always around and Dante Johnson has been cut and re-signed and played every conceivable role for the 49ers, I just have a lot of respect for him because I remember when he was drafted many years ago, smart guy, uh, just a good pro, good guy to have on the team. And I, I thought that, you know, he stepped in and I, I, I would think, man, if – if Emmanuel Mosley is going to be out for a week or two or whatever, that Dante Johnson has to be the guy. So I'm kind of curious what, what the perspective that you gained Laura from where the 49ers are from the cornerback position. Was that something you guys talked about much on the post game show? We didn't talk too much about the cornerbacks. I mean, unless you, like you said, unless you shut a team out, the cornerbacks aren't really going to get a, a ton of praise because as Shanahan mentioned, I think it was last week or, or two weeks ago that you're going to lose a lot of those battles in every single game. It's almost like in baseball, like you're going to lose more than you win when you're at the plate, when you're a pitcher, that's just how it goes. And it's almost like that position. That's you start to appreciate the Richard Sherman's of the world and the level that they play out with the, the numbers that they put up. Uh, statistically in the pro football focus kind of categories. It wasn't something that we dove too deep into, but it Emmanuel Mosley, if the 49ers lose him for any amount of time, that's a big loss. That's a big loss for the Niners. And now we'll see, it does seem like Fred Warner is going to be able to come back against the Bengals and we'll have to wait and see about Debo Samuel. That was supposed to be a one to two week injury. But on Sunday against Seattle, you start to see that that was stuff that we talked about in the pregame show. And I'm sure everybody listening was considering those factors and it couldn't be overlooked. The two of the biggest playmakers for the 49ers weren't on the field. They're they're not on the field. Now you have other guys that step up and George Kittle and Aziz Alshire. So that's the positive, but those are people that they missed. And that was something that we talked about. I think it was the last podcast how will the 49ers handle it without Debo Samuel? Because you can go back to other seasons, but what's been working for the Niners offense this season has been Debo in everything, in every possible way, whether he has the ball on the ground, whether he has the ball through the air, 
that's what's been working. And you take away that surprise element of Debo Samuel. And it does give the Seahawks defense an advantage because that's what the 49ers have been using. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And unfortunately, Debo is out with an injury. So then you have to try and fix something that ain't broke. Yeah. And, and I mean, George Kettle obviously picked up his end of the bargain and, you know, he had the big day and Brandon Ayuk, um, you know, took a while for the 49ers to even get the ball to him, but he ended up catching three passes for 55 yards. But then after that, you know, it was, it was two, two running backs, Elijah Mitchell and, and Kyle Juszczyk. They combined for five, five catches for 41 yards, 49 yards. Uh, let's uh, I'm doing the math as we go here, Laura. 39 yards, five catches. Yeah, wow, 39 you got it. Yards. That's good. And then there's such a big drop off, you know, with the 49ers' top two receivers, Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk, to the next tier of wide receivers on their team. And Trent Sherfield got the start. He had two catches for 16 yards, and then Jennings had Juwan Jennings had one catch for six yards. So, so there's a, a pretty significant drop off there. Um, but I would say that the 49ers did a better job of compensating for the loss of Fred Warner uh, because Aziz Alshire played at a Pro Bowl level in this game. And I, I think they did you know, a less impressive job of compensating for the loss of Debo Samuel because they really didn't have any kind of running threat outside yeah. of Elijah Mitchell. I was surprised that Jeff Wilson Jr., uh, didn't have any touches. I think he had one touch in the game, got to the corner, but that came back on a penalty. But he was he was bothered in some fashion. Don't know exactly what was bothering him, but you know the that uh, once again Elijah Mitchell just is the workhorse. He was the only running back who touched the ball for the 49ers in this game. So that's where we are right now. And let's. Uh, Unless you have something to add on this game, let's step aside, Laura, and uh, talk about where the 49ers go from here. Hey, the 49ers had a three-game winning streak. That winning streak was snapped on Sunday against the Seattle Seahawks. So the 49ers fall to the Seattle Seahawks 30-23. to The 49ers are 6-6, six and six, and they drop one spot in the NFC playoff race. So if the playoffs were to begin today, the 49ers would be the number seven seed. Mm -hmm. I got news for you. Newsflash, the playoffs do not begin today. Well, I thought I was told that they would. They do not. Wow. And that I've means that misled. there's still five more games to play before the actual playoffs begin. But hey, once again, the 49ers control their own destiny. And this is a very interesting matchup coming up for the 49ers. They might have, I, I think they're going to have Fred Warner back, judged on watching him in pregame warmups. Debo Samuel said last week that he fully intends to be back for this game against the Bengals. This game coming up matches right now the number seven seed in the NFC against the number seven seed in the AFC. In other words, this game will be treated by both teams as kind of a playoff game because there's a decent chance whoever loses this game will no longer be in line right now, or I should say a week from now, for a playoff spot. So it's a big game. Yeah, it seems that the Bengals season has been similar to the 49ers in that it's been, they've had these flashes of greatness. And then in their week 13 matchup, they get land blasted by the Chargers. Land blasted. <laughs> land I, I mean, it was, what was it? 40 something to, what 40, was the final? 41 to 22. The 41 to 22. That's a, that's a, a whopping. That is a whopping. That's I think a whopping. I think it was even worse at some point. I think I glanced up and it was like 24 to nothing. So they did score some points. They do have Joe Burrow. They have Joe Burrow suffered a pinky injury. Oh, did he really? On Sunday, but he is expected as far as everything that I've read um, on Sunday, he is expected to play against the 49ers, but it was his pinky wasn't looking right. Wow. Okay. We all know what happens when your pinky don't look right. It's it's not good it's if you're a quarterback good. in the NFL. No, no. So or, or that's even something for me good. As a guy who who does typing for a living. That's true. But you would you would be like you would tap out. I'd probably well I would just. Can Laura would, do my I, stories? This I would hunt and pack. You'd go one. That would be a miserable existence for you, Matt. Yeah. So I that'll know. be something that we'll follow this week with. We will follow. 
and the other thing is we talk a lot about, or you know, we talked in the last segment about the cornerback situation. Uh, they're going to be facing one of the absolute stars, up and coming stars in this league. And that's Jamar Chase for the, uh, for the Bengals. He's a, a rookie. He caught uh, five passes for 52 yards in that loss to the Chargers. But he is a, he is a load. And the 49ers are going to be really challenged against the Cincinnati Bengals, a team. Do you call them the Bengals or the Bengals? I think I used to say the Bengals. Bing- uh, I think I'm kind of a mix. I think I'm, I'm Bengals. Bengals. That was that, I'm not Bengals and I'm not the Bengals. Bengals. The all girls band of the eighties, I believe. <laughs> I don't even know. You don't know? The Bengals? The Bengals. Anyway, we move on here on 49ers talk. How do you guys say it? Send us your voice messages yeah, on it's Twitter. Great. Bengals. I think I call them the Bengals. The Bengals. That's kind of a mix, though. It's not the Bengals and it's not the Bengals. It's yeah, the Bengals. It's, I always anyway. prefer to just like kind of go right down the middle and you say leave, it quickly. Leave enough gray area so people think I'm saying it right. When in actuality, I'm who saying knows? It, yeah. it's the Bengals. Yeah. So the 49ers will be looking to recapture their formula against the Cincinnati team on the road. The formula is. Repeat after me, Laura. It's run the football. Run the football. Yeah, that's what it is. That's all it is. Run the football a lot because that takes in as I I've learned this season, that takes everything into consideration. You you can't run the football a lot if you're giving up fake punts for touchdowns. You can't run the football a lot if you're throwing two interceptions. You can't run the football a lot if your kick returner fumbles. You can't run the ball a lot if you convert 30 percent on third downs you need and you do need the takeaways the 49ers defense supplied the takeaways against the seattle seahawks just all those areas didn't add up yeah and generally you're controlling the clock if you're running the ball a lot too which is yeah. an area on that three game win streak that the 49ers basically what they did during that three game stretch go back and repeat that not yeah. week 13. Go back to the three game winning streak and repeat everything that you did there. And then it's the thing like Seattle has been like destroyed week in, week out when it comes to time of possession. But they had the time of possession edge on the 49ers in this game by more than six minutes, almost seven minutes. So, uh, yeah, it's time to get back to basics. It's time to get back to what they do best. And that's just take care of the football. Well, I shouldn't say that. Well, they do it. They're at their best when they do that best. Okay. That, I can track that, I think. When they're, when they're winning, they're playing good football. And when they're playing good football, they're winning. It's kind of funny when you when you say that, because I think about on the on the shows and even here, it's it is sim simplistic because it sounds so simple. It sounds so elementary. But George Kittle mentioned that a few weeks ago when they were in the midst of that losing streak and everybody's trying to come up with these reasons of why the 49ers were so bad. And he was like, really, we're just turning the football over a lot and we're not running the ball and we're not controlling the time of possession. And it sounds so simple, but it really is. And it's, I think it's a rhythm for the 49ers, which is why we've seen them when generally when they get off to a hot start, which is what concerned me with that punt fake. And then you see Seattle get, get kind of the wind behind their sails. And honestly, from that moment, I was like, oh boy, here we go. Because the Niners just, they do better when they've, they've got some confidence and they've got some points on the board. And it seems that settles Jimmy Garoppolo a little bit more, but Anything can happen in a rivalry game. So I don't necessarily take the week 13 game and say, that's who the 49ers are going to be moving forward is, you know, back to their midseason poor form. I don't, I don't think that I just, you look in college football and the iron bowl with what happened with Auburn and Alabama and Auburn had no business being in that game and they go to four overtimes. It's just Anything can happen in those games. You just kind of throw everything out the window. So moving forward, I think the 49ers are going to be locked in. I don't think that they weren't locked in against Seattle. Losing is a taste that they've had in their mouths recently. And now, of course, very recently with losing the Seattle Seahawks. But it's not like they need the motivation. I think they have the motivation with how poorly they've played. And then you have the motivation with seeing what you're capable of on the three game win streak. It's not like they're a decent team in the NFL when 
when they win football games, they're really good. They have a shot to be one of the top teams in the NFL when they're at their best. And I think that they know that. Yeah. Well, they're also one of the worst teams when they're at their worst. Exactly. It's, it's kind of a strange, yeah, it's kind right. of strange. It, it, honestly, it's, it's kind of a weird team because they play terrible when, <laughs> when they lose games and they're so good when they win that you, it kind of confuses you. Yeah. Well, what isn't confusing is that there are five games left in the season for the control their own destiny and we will be there every step of the way. It should be one heck of a ride because like it or not, this, this game on Sunday was, was highly entertaining. I'm sure it, you know, some, some minutes of people's lives were shaved off because of the stress, but it, it just, it's all part of this, all part of the book of the, the 2021 season. It's another chapter and uh, for the owners still control their destiny. Big one coming up against, Cincinnati and I have a feeling we'll be saying a big one coming up against fill in the blank for whomever they're facing every week the rest of the year yeah the fight for the playoffs is on five games remaining every one of them matters the 49ers they got to get it done if they want to get in the playoffs